1947 seemed to be the first account of a human purposely contacted by a UFO. 1950s saw many more sightings, and the first reported contactees were gaining popular attention. They were universally telling tales of alien technology far outstripping our own. They were at the very edge of contemporary understanding. They brought messages of humanity's place in the universe, the comparative peace and advancement of the alien civilizations that they contacted, and the possibility of humanity's transformation to take ranks amongst other intelligent life in the universe. There were legends that stemmed from this, Realism and the Aetherius Society boasted contactees with benevolent contacts from advanced civilizations, here to help us in the process of a transforming our civilization into one of peace and prosperity. Something that clearly was not a reality for many. We will touch on this later with the death of the American dream and the stifling rigidity of pop culture and the media with parody religion, the Church of Subgenius. But for now, we will tackle classic UFO religions. Broadly, these can be referred to as millennial ufology. Put simply, a belief in collective salvation through massive change, whether progressive or catastrophic, incubated in the anxiety of a Cold War culture these religions were built around the fact that at any point a weapon could fall from the sky and destroy everything you know, erode your body with an invisible power that you do not understand. For the first time in history, this could happen without warning, without physical portent, but many supposed extraterrestrial contacts promised to help us slow or prevent this damage coming out of an age of genuine fear, this fear of potential nuclear war could be reimagined in UFO mythology with a face, a literal reincarnation of a face we know, a god, an awesome power, but a known awesome power. In this way, we could reframe this fear, reframe the conflict with a clear good and bad, and we can pin our hopes in the eventual triumph of the good. An example of this kind of religion we will talk about is the Aetherius Society. The Aetherius Society was, and still is, a new religious movement founded in the mid-1950s by Dr George King. King himself was positioned as the primary terrestrial mental tunnel of said religion. He was a de facto spiritual leader and the religion was named after the being King claimed to have telepathically contacted and then channeled. A cosmic master from Venus, following the lineage of Buddha and Jesus, Aetherian beliefs draw in all religions as in stemming from the same source. Any famous religious figure, reincarnated being from our solar system. King's aim was to communicate with the higher order beings which had made contact with him and further their conversations. He did this through yogic meditation and he aimed to cooperate with his cosmic masters to help humanity solve the current earthly problems and to advance to a new age. Said cosmic masters are described as spiritual beings on another plane than ours. By design, they are non-corporeal. It's interesting that um, by the 1950s, it was by now common knowledge that just how unlikely it would be for physical, intelligent life to exist in our solar system. But these beings were non-corporeal. And they existed at a higher vibratory rate to ours, a rate that could be voluntarily lowered as to appear visible. So the idea of an alterable vibratory rate ties in with the ideas of the fourth dimension. Now, the fourth dimension is a term coined by Johann Karl Friedrich Zollner, apologies for the pronunciation, and is a dimension that supposedly exists alongside our own, in which all kinds of paranormal entities may exist and temporarily press upon our own dimension. 
Zollner was a German astrophysicist, and he was also one of the earliest psychical investigators. It is not suggesting too much to suggest that some of the proponents of early UFO religions may have had knowledge of Zollner's writings. Many of them had existing backgrounds in mysticism, psychic readings and such. So this idea of a fourth dimension did not spring up independently of Zollner's work. I think it's safe to say this idea was around. And for some people, provided a really useful way of justifying what they may have seen as unexplainable phenomena. This could all be explained by a fourth dimension with the ability to influence our own. This allies, of course, with popular UFO sightings of the time. The implausible speed they often seem to show, their appearances and disappearances, lack of corporeal evidence. It may also explain the difficulties of capturing the beings on camera if frame rate would be taken into consideration. It is clear that this religion in many ways was directly reactive to the discourse around ufology. Most UFO sightings of the time had little or no accompanying audio, for example. People who have visited occasionally described a sound, a buzzing in the ear or a hum or just a feeling more than actual sounds emanating from the beings. And most of the stories were oral accounts retold in print with few, if any, accompanying visuals and no way of including any sound. This would make sense. So it would make sense that beings would exist outside of a vibratory range our ears could ordinarily pick up or distinguish as more than just a feeling, a vague feeling, instantly recognisable and easily described to others. King's statements also weave themselves neatly around another facet of contemporary sightings, the tendency in descriptions of beams of light to appear to bend in midair or be stopped by invisible crafts or walls or something imperceptible to humans. He says, At times the operators of scout vessels and motherships choose to rotate the streams of photons around their crafts in a 360 degree arc, thereby rendering themselves invisible to the ordinary eye. There's an interesting tension here in the 1950s and 60s that meant people had a belief that light could soon be bent in midair. Nuclear radiation at the time was similarly understood to have powerful properties, but their full effects were unknown. So could it be possible invisible radiation had power over light and could cause it to bend in midair or even stop? If it could reduce the city to rubble, why wouldn't it be able to? Even though this is something that exists on the very fringe of our understanding now, how recent is it in the collective mind the knowledge of things such as radio waves, radiation in general, the behaviour of light as a wave through the air. These are new concepts and different ways that these could interact with each other is, is an idea that exists on the very fringes of our understanding. Just as higher evolved life forms may inhabit non-corporeal forms, Aetherianism also sets the Earth itself as a highly evolved living entity. Their belief sprang up against the very real fear of the Earth's destruction on a burgeoning knowledge that the Earth was being negatively impacted by human means. It cites the environmental and societal problems of Earth as a symptom of a larger spiritual energy crisis. A symptom masquerading as a cause. Funnily enough, it is the Aetherian position that it is the lowly karmic position of mankind that explains why extraterrestrials don't openly land on Earth. By the sheer number of their visitations, again, may be a symptom masquerading as a cause. We do not seek understanding in the midst of numerous paranormal visitations, but we experience a societal interest in paranormal 
interactions due to a deep need for understanding. As previously mentioned, the Aetherian society didn't exist as an alternative or fringe religion purely down to the alien interaction at its core. Honestly, it's probably pretty low down on the list of the reasons it is only ever talked of as a UFO religion. For one, the Aetherian society is a syncretic religion, i.e. it draws in many elements of other established religions. It is based on theosophy, the idea that you can gain knowledge of God through spiritual work, study, or intuition, and it incorporates millennial ideas of a coming societal transformation, focusing on the idea that using spiritual energy can improve the calibre of the entire world. A concrete example they give of this is use of spiritual energy batteries or prayer batteries. So these batteries exist, physically exist around the world in areas of spiritual significance, often mountaintops. The idea behind these being to store healing psychic energy in the batteries that can then be channeled and released when and where it is most needed. Operation Prayer Power is the guided release of spiritual energy from said spiritual energy batteries to prevent wars and disaster. Spiritual pushes are the practice of drawing prana to Earth from an orbiting spaceship called Satellite Number 3, which has the power to magnify unselfish energy by 3,000. This magnification of prayer and good energy crucially doesn't depend on the intention of the participant. It simply does it as an unbiased physical process. So are the beliefs of the society. And to this day, many people make pilgrimages up to said batteries to pray on certain days where their efforts will be magnified and their energy will be redistributed out into the world to benefit those who most need it whether they know about that or not. And the proof, however many wars, however many disasters haven't happened due to this focus positive energy. Now, the Aetherian society is also interesting that part of its beliefs echo the changing of the narratives to UFOs over time. Into the late 50s and 60s, the group started to focus their teachings more on awareness of the silence group. Now, the silence group are said to be men in black-like shadowy figures who work for governments and institutions to prevent the truth from getting out and to purposefully suppress information about our cosmic masters. Indeed, at this time, research was being done behind closed doors in America and the UK into UFO accounts and any accounts from government or military personnel were quashed for the very reason that accounts from people from the military or from the government, their word held more weight. As described, there was a question of, are these aliens or is this military testing? If someone from the military comes out and says, well, I think it's aliens... <laughs> There's a lot more to unpack there, we'll just put it there. This anti-establishment thread, though, it only gained momentum as time went on. And as further UFO organisations tended towards cult-like followings and the suppression of individuality, I'll end on King's words. My friends, flying saucers as such don't count. They're just the materialistic vehicles. It's the message which the people bring to this earth that does count. And the greatest part of the message is this. That it's service to mankind which is important in these days. I'll briefly touch on another UFO religion of a similar kind, just so you can start to see the kind of threads we are talking about proliferating through UFO thought. The International Raelian Movement is the largest UFO religion in the world currently. In many ways, it is the classic image you picture when thinking of UFO religions, or at least I do. Raelians believe that scientifically advanced extraterrestrials known as Elohim, sorry, 
created life on Earth through genetic engineering. And that combination of human cloning and that through a combination of human cloning and mind transfer, we can ultimately achieve eternal life. Past religious teachers such as Jesus, Buddha, again, <laughs> and Muhammad are said to have been sent by the scientifically advanced extraterrestrials to teach humanity. The Elohim are said to be planning a future visit to complete their revelation and education of humanity. Now, as we know, they're not the first or the last to count important religious figures as part of their puzzle. But they seem to be a kind of average for all the religions and cults I've read about and will be talking about so far. They're kind of the classic coke of UFO religions. And I'm skimming over a lot of information here. But I thought it was worth pointing out just how similar some of these can be. With differing beliefs at the core. But the same sentiment. And the same kinds of questions. And the same kinds of answers. Raelian priest Thomas said on this topic. The difference between Raelians and Heaven's Gate and Jim Jones, etc., is that the others destructively believe in a God who would give them a better life after death. Just like most believers in monotheistic religions do today, and hence the risk of suicide chasing afterlife rewards. Raelians believe in enjoying life now with happiness and laughter. Raelian beliefs rather directly address the mental need that they serve and what exactly they offered that current ideologies didn't or couldn't. But as previously mentioned, they were far from the first to acknowledge the psychological aspects of how we deal with extraterrestrial encounters. Orfeo Angelucci is an early contactee, notable in that to many he is viewed even by skeptics, as more of a religious visionary in a flying saucer context, rather than a cynical exploiter of the credulous. His initial contact was in 1952 in Burbank, California, where driving home from work at an aircraft factory, he saw a saucer emerge, emitting small glows from within it. In front of his eyes emerged a crystal cup full of delicious healing liquid and a voice telling him not to fear. His claims run on and follow the expected pattern, but interestingly, they caught the attention of Carl Jung, who observed in them the individuation process, i.e. the process where the individual self develops out of of an undifferentiated unconscious. The central problem of modern psychology is plainly depicted in an unconscious symbolic form, although the author, with his somewhat primitive mentality, has taken it quite literally as a concrete happening. Even very early on, it was noted the psychological benefits of the UFO religion, or more broadly UFO faith, as an outlet and an abstract form through which the fundamental struggles of humanity can be worked through. George Van Tassel, a hugely influential contactee, brought Ashtar to public attention in 1952. Ashtar communicated with Van Tassel telepathically and directly addressed the fear that the then-in-development hydrogen bomb had the power to set off a chain reaction which would destroy the planet. Ashtar warned that if the scientists didn't stop the project immediately, we, meaning his people, shall eliminate all projects connected with such. In all communication he maintained a stilted grammar, and long run-on sentences with almost stream-of-consciousness chained clauses. One must be aware, he warned, of the distinction between the ships of light and the ships of abduction. 
But the 1950s also saw a concurrent souring of the narrative towards our alien visitors. Whether the aliens of these narratives were the face of good or evil begins to change at this point. To almost unanimously good, ancient reincarnated souls with friendly faces, to the famous greyskins, broadly humanoid, either symbolising our salvation or our damnation. Just how quickly the atmosphere around UFOs were changing is emblematized by the changing fortunes of George Adamski. Born in 1891 and largely forgotten today, George Adamski was at the time probably the most famous flying saucer contactee. Set the blueprint for the UFO encounter and his alleged meeting with a Venusian in the Californian desert in November 1952 poured fuel on the smouldering saucer fire. His encounters were apparently numerous, involving Venusians, Martians and Saturnians, painting our solar system as bristling with intelligent life on the verge of contacting us, an Earth ready to take its place in the universe. In 1962, he was said to have flown by spacecraft to attend an interplanetary conference, presumably a spokesperson for Earth. By his death in 1965, even many of his most devoted followers were convinced that either he was misleading them or he was being tricked by malevolent aliens or even malevolent government agencies. Polish-born Adamski emigrated with his parents to upstate New York when he was still an infant. He began his assimilation into the local occult scene as head of the Royal Order of Tibet, a metaphysical school based on the channeled teachings of Tibetan lamas. With the popularization of the UFOs in the 40s, Adamski was one of the first to produce photographs of the crafts with the publication of the images in Paranormal Digest Fate in the early 50s, earned him a kind of paranormal celebrity and an audience keen for more. And he did not disappoint. In 1952, the six witnesses looked on, containing among them other noted contactees. Adamski observed the landing of a saucer and the emergence of a visiting Venusian, blonde-haired and beautiful Orthon. Three weeks later, Orthon returned and allowed his scout vessel to be photographed. The resulting image for many defined the visual of the flying saucer, domed disc with three-ball landing gear. An image which was to be supplanted in many Western circles, but remains to this day a de facto UFO in areas of Asia. Adamski's accounts were published in Desmond Leslie's massively influential flying saucers have landed and two years later Adamski expanded on them in his own publication Inside the Spaceships. Says Adamski, the Space Brothers have indeed come to help us out of our backward war-seeking ways and help prevent inevitable nuclear war. Their philosophy allied with his own and with these ideas there was born both the hopeful believer and the sceptic. To some, he offered a way to circumvent our inevitable destruction. To others, he brought ridicule to the field. Adamski himself professed his detractors as members of the same silence group of the Ethereus Society. With the 60s, Adamski had many friends in high places, meeting with John F. Kennedy and Vice President Hubert Humphrey. His detractors were also growing more numerous, and his influence beginning to wane. As Adamski tried to sway with the breeze of current thought, and put stock into notions of psychic approaches he was previously vocally critical of, it became evident for some he was recycling his own material, in whatever form he saw fit, and using his beautiful, blonde Venusian as a mouthpiece for them. He died poor and discredited, and to most his name faded into obscurity. 
The death of George Adamski in 1965, for many signalled also the death of the traditional contactee movement. But the needs of the traditional contactee movement still needed to be served, namely the desire to legitimise aspects of religion still comforting but with a weakening ability to say, one that was still viewed as having failed them in its organised form or concealed from them information that could be their salvation. From this, the 1960s saw the beginning of accounts of abduction and abductees, beginning with Betty and Barney Hill in 1961. From then on, many alien encounters were frightening affairs of capture and invasive and painful subjection to pseudoscientific experimentation. The reasoning behind them was still beyond our understanding, but the intent behind them was now sinister. The aliens wanted to control us, understand us as enemy, not friend. On the night of September 19th to 20th, 1961, whilst travelling through White Mountains, Betty and Barney Hill experienced a close encounter with a UFO. Barney stepped out from their car and saw several human-like figures inside a craft spied through his binoculars. But this was the least strange part of his experience. It was only when they were back home did they start to realise that several hours were missing from their conscious recall. In November, Betty began to recall information through a series of unusually vivid dreams in which beings forced her and her husband onto a foreign craft, where they were separated and individually experimented on by grey-skinned humanoids. In January, still plagued by these thoughts, they sought advice from a Boston psychiatrist in an attempt to combat the increasing levels of anxiety they felt around the event. Their psychiatrist, Benjamin Simon, had the pair hypnotised, and under hypnosis, they separately recounted their abduction. The incident made the Boston paper and was later reworked into a best-selling book. It's important to remember that these contrasting ideas about what a UFO is, and therefore what an alien encounter is, were all circulating around the same time. For instance, only three years before Betty and Barney's experience was another famous incident involving respected policeman Lonnie Samora. While some accounts were leading towards abduction, with the only physical evidence of the aliens being the scars and mysterious marks left on the abductees, Lonnie's case seemed to present one of the few with documented physical evidence not known to be falsified or at least layered through the complicated web of the human psyche. On April 24, 1964, Lonnie Zamora spotted an egg-shaped UFO resting in an isolated area on the outskirts of Socorro, New Mexico. He reported seeing two figures dressed in all white examining the craft, but they fled when they spotted Zamora running behind their craft and disappearing. The UFO later departed with a roar, spewing flames. Several independent witnesses can confirm the scorch marks left on the ground by the erupting flame, as well as the impressions in the dirt, including other police officers and even Project Blue Book personnel. It was confirmed by all that the marks could not have been done without tremendous downward force. There was no simple explanation for how the incident, or at least the marks left behind, could have been faked. And so it was judged by Project Blue Book as unknown. That was part two of the history of the UFO religion. Stay tuned for part three, where we look at the changing position of those involved in UFO encounters.